Morning all. Okay, let's have a look at round six when England met Italy. Nigel Short had a very interesting game on board three against GM Sabino Brunello. Let's have a look at that. C4. Nigel plays the English opening. Let's flip the board. E5. Okay, after knight c3, knight f6, it looks at the moment like a kind of reversed Sicilian variation. Uh, but it is a standard variation in the English opening. So knight f3, knight c6. Now e3 from white. So white is interested in a quick d4 here. Bishop b4. Now queen b3. Black ventures now e4. Okay. Does white dare to leave himself with double pawns by playing knight d4? He does actually. He plays knight d4. After knight takes d4, white cannot take here because of knight c2 check. So Nigel takes on d4. And the bishop exchanges itself off on c3 here actually which you might think is a little bit of a controversial decision uh, because it's sort of opening up maybe this bishop giving white the bishop pair interesting decision perhaps let's just quickly check this position here move like bishop e7 if white plays d3 white's liberating this bishop in any case and white central control seems actually quite good here in this position. So okay, uh, bishop takes c3 was played. D takes c3. D6. Nigel plays bishop e2. Now avoiding the nasty pin now with h6. Discouraging bishop g fives in the future. H three. Nigel's not immediately castling. There could be another option here, prompted by h three. That white could be interested in castling on the queen side. Black's not immediately castling either. B six. I think I've actually seen something just just uh, yesterday on on the very talented Peter Lalix uh, Facebook wall about. Um, having to castle or not you should give great consideration about routinely castling and it seems both GMs here are, are waiting at the moment uh, not not routinely castling so it's finding useful waiting moves in this position okay white plays bishop e3 which okay does actually give the option of castling queenside so it's fairly useful h3 of course it's very useful because it's stopping any knight g4 possibility. Queen e7. Now white doesn't hang around, in fact. He castles queenside. Not worried about any potential queenside attack from black. With b6 being played, it would seem, I don't know, more difficult to play for b5. But white's got b5 under, un, under a grip here. Black castles. Now g4. So are the chances with white here? Black sets up a blockade, potential blockade against g5. h4. And now interestingly plays f5, which does kind of invite that opening of the g-file. And that's accepted, that invitation is accepted. g takes f, bishop takes, rook dg1. King moves to h8. And now doubling rooks seems logical, just double rooks here. Rook g3. Now in this position, actually, you'd think the follow-up might be rook hg1. But actually, for a moment now, queen d1 is played, bringing the queen uh, to bear on this diagonal at the moment. And maybe can be usefully um, deployed to help the rooks at some point. C5, B3, Rook AD8, as though black might be interested in D5 and opening up the D file. 
King moves to b2 now. Rook d7. Now finally doubling the rooks. Queen e6. Okay, in this position, the move a4 is played. Really kind of reinforcing a lock on black playing b5. Might have been possible for black to temporarily uh, sack a, a pawn here. So that's been kind of ruled out, giving the option rather of taking with the a pawn if black plays b5. So it's sort of strengthening the position on the queen side here. After king h7, now h5 is played, marking out that g6 square for use, potential use, king h8. And now an Alekhine's gun is being constructed here with one rook 1 to g2. With the queen here, it will be an Alekhine's gun scenario, travelling on g7. This is interrupted in this position with bishop h3. Interestingly, um, bishop h3, you might be kind of the knee jerk reaction is, is to move uh, the rook and get on back, back with a plan of some sort. Um, there's actually uh, a move. Well, in, in the game, rook h2 was played. I wonder if, if I give you 20 seconds, you can spot. A different idea which might be stronger than the game continuation here. Uh, so emotionally I guess the knee jerk reaction is to move the rook. But if I give you twenty seconds to think about this position, <laughs> what what do you think what else do you reckon could be played here? So twenty seconds starting from now. Okay, now there's an expression. Okay, loose pieces tend to fall off, or, or something like that. Now this this piece is sort of loose because it's only protected by one piece, and it's in in the opponent's territory, and it's also attacked. And it's only been protected by one piece. In fact, I think Nigel might have missed the trick here, uh, which is d5, just trying to undermine the defender, and. More subtly, after queen f5, the bishop is now restricted. So it's only got one retreat square. And in fact, in this position, rook h2 would seem to win the bishop. Let's just engine verify this. Where can the bishop move here? Because white's got that very good grip on g4 still from this battery. Stopping bishop g4. Let's have a look here. So I think this was uh, a moment of blunder. D five is plus three point eight six. So even even twenty seven hundred GMs sometimes miss a forcing move. Um, but why? You see, it's easy to uh, criticise with engines who will pick up, which will pick up these uh, tactical opportunities. Um, but D five in principle, you know, it closes up the position and potentially gives black the e5 square. So it's not something you you necessarily want to do uh, without uh, greatly thinking about it. Because uh, this tension is also um, useful to keep. Um, for, for white, if you look at this position, white also is interested in po possibly uh, playing at some point d takes because the queen's also you know on that d file so okay so d5 is is to be done with some some caution so okay i'm i'm just trying to get to grips with um you know sometimes uh, strategically uh important moves also uh, they're being used here in this tactical context um but they're you know strategically committed moves here like d5 but they're also Forcing moves, winning a piece here in this particular position. So it was a missed tactical opportunity, but uh, okay. So rook h2 was played. Bishop f5. 
and now rook h4 okay so maybe now well the queen can also come to h1 the rook can potentially go to f4 the rook's keeping control of g4 as well after bishop h7 in fact queen h1 is now played and there's pressure on e4 the knight of course and bishop are holding up e4 quite nicely here rook d f7 and now rook f4 is played knight d7 an exchange of rooks now queen h4 which does imply queen d8 looks dangerous potentially knight f6 blocking that diagonal rook g1 rook d7 bit of maneuvering here queen f4 queen e8 queen h2 bishop g8 and now this battery on d6 bishop f4 how does that defend queen f8 rook d1 setting up again potentially the option of d takes which is why you know this d5 isn't to be taken lightly it just just so happens in the tactical context it, it was absolutely appropriate but you know here you can see that d takes is, is suddenly you know it's a useful resource um black is prompted here to play d5 which does loosen his dark squares he plays d5 loosening his dark square control and note he hasn't got the dark squared bishop so this is this is quite a strategically committed move as well playing d5 now for black so is black actually worse in this position because white's got a very nice battery and control on the position I think black is worse now queen e7 and dc5 you see that dc5 has come up as a, as a major option so it's a nice to have option d takes c5 in some variations okay so um okay so here d5 now after d takes c5 b takes white takes on d5 okay he's exposing a bit his king on this diagonal which looks a bit dangerous knight takes bishop c4 relying on the pin on the d file now after rook f7 bishop g3 holding the fort holding up f2 rook f5 and white just takes the knight now on d5 um, with this opposite color bishop scenario now again queen h4 is more dangerous perhaps than before things have opened up more bishop g8 losing the pawn in fact so he, he just given up the e4 pawn here to queen e4 and you might think well okay the idea is quite dangerous to attack here but was is this actually um, is this actually necessary to play bishop g8 is it a dynamic attacking move but is it necessary in the game bishop g8 does look as though it's not technically the best something like queen e8 we've still got a roughly balanced game but this this pawn sack seems okay to take it as in the game okay there's nothing major about taking that pawn here rook f2 is not like crushing or anything b3 is not easy that easy to exploit queen f7 okay so something has to be done about b3 c4 and white is losing the h pawn anyway so he okay he's won that center pawn and he's given up his flank pawn so potentially these two pawns might be dangerous but uh we've got this opposite color bishop scenario now and white plays a very interesting sort of prophylaxis safety type move he plays king a3 now queen f6 which does imply if the rook ever moves off the first rank then queen a1 is going to be embarrassing rook e1 so bishop e5 might be on the cards among other things queen c3 in fact bishop e5 is played here check check and the bishop tucks way back on on b2 so this looks good now for white this this central control and this pin on g7 and there are, there are 
there, there is a tactical threat here, which is missed. Uh, black plays queen takes f2, nabbing a pawn. But uh, can you see this? The move which basically ends ends the game in this position. If I give you twenty seconds, starting from now. Okay. Queen G6. And black actually resigned here. If he plays rook G5, then not, I don't think queen H6 is the move exploiting the pin, but rather, actually, um, let's check this out. Let's check, check this position out before I completely embarrass myself. I think it might be to do with Queen H6 now and, and Rook E8. Queen G6. If Rook G5, check yes, forcing Bishop H7. Then we have Rook E8 check. It is using the pin, and that's mating black. That that's the problem with this position. So this this Rook is very useful for Rook E8, which we've seen enough. This tactical idea in a few games covered recently on this channel. So Queen G6 is a cruncher. And if Queen is putting Queen F7 as an idea, then the bishop can be made use of in this position. Bishop takes G7, Queen takes, Queen takes H5. There's no useful checks or anything. So that looks like a cruncher, Queen G6. If queen takes, then queen g7 is mate. There's not too many options here for black, so this looks as though it, it is all over. So if black didn't take on f2, though, okay, let's let's say rook g5. So apparently, okay, here it looks as though white has something. Rook h1, threatening rook h6. So the queen comes back. Queen B seven, and this this looks as though it's, it's favourable for White here, for a different reason. Taking on A seven, running past pawn here, it's it's better for White this position anyway, but it's going to be it's going to be tricky. I mean, it's going to be a lot more moves. Okay, so. We saw that blunder in the end. Let's have a look again at this game in overview and summary. So, uh, interesting double pawns position. Uh, both sides the laying castling. Now, White Castle's queen side, in fact. This opening up of the G file looks initially favourable for White, but. Um, there's a tactical issue generated with a slightly loose piece very shortly when bishop h3 was played that wasn't pounced on with d5 uh, there's a dark square kind of infiltration leading to a rook exchange then there's white coming back to the center as though rook d as though d takes c5 is becoming a useful move on the cards so what is that nice pressure on d6 and all this h5 is still a vulnerability at the moment it's black protected but you see it becoming a vulnerability soon in the game continuation once the bishop comes off h5 and here you see it being targeted anyway as well and yeah it's basically exchanged off for for the e pawn uh cuz that is not just Attacking B for it's it's definitely securing winning H five. Okay, we get a nice um, this 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 move, and and this idea is neat to put the bishop here. In fact, how would how else would you put the bishop on B two? You know safely if you if you play bishop E five you drop F two with check. 
So he's avoiding queen f2 being check. Um, he's securing that, that use of the e5 square here with bishop e5. So the bishop neatly being tucked on b2. A nice little strategic operation. And once on b2, that it plays a decisive role in, in winning the game now. This queen f2 is it falls tactically to queen g6 in all the variations. Maybe what was actually missed was uh, bishop g7, uh, that, that particular variation with bishop g7 here. Um, so just have a look at that again. If queen f7, we use that decoy, that deflection, rather away from defending h5 here to win the exchange. Otherwise, we use this this tactic, this pin for rookie eight mating. I thought queen f8 to take mate. Okay, so uh, yeah, that was an interesting game in some respects. Hope you found it interesting. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.